Welcome to the People Planet Profit Podcast. I'm Hayley Jarrick, CEO of the Supply Chain Sustainability School, and today I'm joined by Dr. Natalie Galea. Dr. Natalie is a Senior Research Fellow at the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning at the University of Melbourne and is an Adjunct Senior Research Fellow at the Australian Human Rights Institute, UNSW in Sydney. Natalie studies human rights and gender equality in the construction center, sector and human rights and athlete abuse in elite sport. Her most recent research examined the effects of a five-day working week on the well-being of construction workers and their families. Welcome, Natalie. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so good to be here. And I'm just going to sort of let everybody else know listening, this is a bit of a fangirl moment for me because I sit back and just admire all of your work that you're doing in, the, in this research space. And in terms of, um, you know, sometimes you can look at research and think that it's not relevant to the everyday or that it's sort of, um, you know, a, a fun sound grab on morning radio. Um, yeah. But the work that you're, the research that you're doing is such game changing in the way that um, is transforming um, some people's lives and the well-being and just the human aspects of it and the applications to every day is really exciting. Um, so, yeah, if I completely fangirl out on you, you'll know why. Um, but I think it's really lovely um, that you've given the time to be able to chat to us. Well, it's very nice and very – we're always just thrilled that someone reads our work in academia. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great to hear. Oh, excellent. So I suppose there's a couple of things that I think are really important for us to talk about. And I suppose the one that we really wanted to get to was around, um, and the phrase that um, is going around is that putting gender on the tender and, and really sort of focusing on improving um, diversity and wellbeing in construction. So what if, can you summarise for people who haven't um, uh, read any of your research, sort of where that's gotten to and, and um, what you found? Yeah, look, we I, I was part of a big research study in... Um, well, probably five years ago, which looked at why it was that gender equality policies in construction organisations really weren't shifting the dial on um, the fact that the Australian construction sector is the most male-dominated sector and has remained the case and, this, and the statistics have been pretty much um, the same for decades. Um, and we got to the end of the study after working with two large contractors who really kindly allowed us to come in and and um, shadow their construction workers and interview them and look at their policies. And we came to the conclusion that to increase the number of women in construction, you must be willing to challenge the working conditions of men. And by men, I mean everybody who's generally working on construction sites. And what we found that one of the key barriers to women's participation and particularly their retention is uh, these work practices that are imposed on construction workers. Um, which are long work hours, rigid, there's a lot of rigidity around um, when people start and finish. And a lot of that is normative. It's not absolutely baked into the rules, but a lot of it is normative and it's based on presenteeism and, you know, total availability. And for women who undertake the bulk of the care responsibilities in our society and for young women who are looking up and seeing, you know, are other women being successful in the sector? What we found is that it was really hard for them to navigate having a career and a family. In fact, they were left with sort of this old fashioned choice. And so really, I guess, getting gender on the tender is all about, you know, looking at how what seem to be, you know, gender neutral work practices really have gender consequences. For women, it's about the fact that it rules often women out if they've got any care responsibilities out of careers in construction. And really for men, there's a really sad side, which is these incredibly high suicide rates. It's the second highest um, of all sectors. Um, mates in construction research out of Melbourne University um, tells us that every second day a construction worker will take their own life and that they're six times more likely to die of suicide than from a workplace accident. And we certainly saw that in our research when we shadowed men. And I have to say it really shocked me because I'd come from working in construction for 15 years for big contractors. But when I started walking with men and spending the day with them, I encountered people having men having panic attacks, talking about substance use, um, marriage breakdowns, um, this real issue of wanting to be very much a part of their kids' lives and their families' lives, but being, you know, this push and pull around being the breadwinner. So um, looking at how we work is really important in terms of um, shifting the dial on gender inequality and also work 
um, worker wellbeing. And to do that, we really have to bake it into the procurement process. We can't expect contractors to have to magically create gender equality when the conditions of what how they're procured, you know, really constrain their ability to really make progress in this area. I think so many things um, about that study really sort of ring home for me and touch uh, touched so many sore points in my soul. So I am a child of my dad used to work heavy construction um, when I was young. Uh, the exact scenario that you've just played out was exactly the same in the 80s, right? Mm -hmm. Like it was just, um, there was no way that my mum could possibly go back to work while my dad was working heavy construction because it was just impossible to be able to do that and be essentially a single mum at home with three kids. Mm -hmm. um, and the volume of time in which I would even get to spend with my dad um, was really short. You know, mm -hmm. I'd sort of wake up super early in the morning um, just to spend time with him and then he'd get frustrated because he has to go off to a you know, 12-hour day and it wasn't, you know, all of that those really sort of integral things. Um, and I was lucky because my dad moved out of working in heavy construction and moved into sort of a private surveying practice and I got to spend more time with him and we're able to do fun things like, you know, bless his soul, he used to wake up at 8 o'clock, you know, 7 o'clock every Saturday morning and hang out the whole Saturday playing netball with us and things like that, which just was an impossibility. Like it wouldn't have even happened. And some, um, you know, my sisters and I were all born in three separate towns because we moved around so much with heavy construction and sometimes he wouldn't even be living in the same postcode that we were living in um, while we were doing that sort of stuff. So it is, it's, it's, there's so many touch points in that that really ring home for me. And I think that most people who hear the statistics around suicide in construction are just flabbergasted that this isn't a bigger issue that everybody's talking about, you know. Um, everyone talks about safety in the workplace and thinking of the really heavy things, but just those stats around suicide and the mental health of, of um, men, particularly in construction, it just goes to show that the environment isn't just toxic for women, it's toxic for men and something's yeah. got to give, right? Yeah, absolutely. It is. And I'm, I've got a very similar background. My family is, were plumbing subcontractors. So my parents ran a small business and we actually used to get in trouble of a morning if we were down too early because that was my yeah. dad's quiet time. But, you know, we had utes loading material in the mornings and afternoons. So I very much appreciate, you know, having come from a family that's, you know, had a worker in the construction sector. And I still do. My brother is a plumber now. So um, it still resonates. Yeah. And I think it's it's like, like you said, it's a whole a lot of the it's the normative behaviours that have been ingrained in that place. And so not surprisingly, I suppose I <laughs> the first job I had was working in steel manufacturing, which is also a very male dominated industry. Um, and a lot of the practices that I felt being a 20 something year old woman um, in that workplace um, were quite interesting for the time I found. Um, and um, I think it sort of gave me a thick skin that I still wear today, but at the same time, it sort of baffled me as to how that sort of that cultural aspect in the ingrained nature of how things how things work. Um, you know, that whole like you have to be first at your desk in the morning if you're at a desk and you have to be last to leave, even if you're just sitting there reading the newspaper on your screen or eating your breakfast, like it was this whole everyone had to one up one another. Um, you know, a lot of the paraphernalia and things that were floating around were just, it's not something that those men would even consider doing at home, but it felt like it was this macho thing they needed to keep up with in the workplace. Um, and then you can just, you know, you can, I mean, you can keep rolling out a thousand other examples just like that. Um, I remember having a conversation with a male worker who um, one floor of a building's bathroom facilities was converted to being women because the other floors were all men. Um, and he took particular offence to that because he'd been using that bathroom for the last 40 years and all of a sudden now it's a, it's a women's bathroom and he has to go to a different one. You know, that's that sort of, you know, and not to mention I was like, I haven't got a choice. I've only got one to go to. You can choose any of the other floors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, Everything but you just... mentioned, you know, falls out of the research around the tolerance of sexism the lack of trust, I think, which is really grounded in the way we work and the sort of, you know, this command and control type leadership, but also the fact that despite actually quite bemuses me, the fact that construction workers routinely work very hard and deliver projects often on time or to time, and, and often the timelines are really tight and hard to grapple with, there's still a lack of trust in the sector and, and toilets are always 
Um, whenever you talk gender equality, you can be sure that there's a conversation about toilets that's about to follow two minutes later um, and, and just having access to them. And I mean, look, toilets also raise an important thing I think that's come out recently with the Respect at Work report is, you know, that safe workplace where you're not going to risk being filmed, you know, or having a shower, which came out of our research or, um, you know, you're not having to travel a kilometre from your work site to find a McDonald's that's got semi clean toilets to go to. So um, I think the thing is, you know, the space really also has an effect of telling uh, um, people who is welcome and who isn't, you know, yeah, um, and there's yeah. this sort of space invader feeling sometimes when you're the only woman on a site, you, you looked at, you're constantly reminded of your, your gender, whether you want to be reminded or not. And, um, you know, so it's it's there's there's multiple factors there, you know, at play in terms of, you know, beyond just the work conditions, but that really um, operate to make it challenging as a place to shift gender equality. Yeah, and like you said, it's just all the little things that it's like that Swiss cheese effect, right? Like it's only yeah. one little thing, but if it's like lots of those little things all add up. Like I remember yeah. trying to get PPE to try and fit correctly. It was a nightmare. Like yeah. it was just cut for men's bodies, not women's bodies, whereas now there's whole, you know, there's multiple brands you could pick from to get some really cool, trendy, like, you know, stretch high-vis pants yeah. for construction sites and, you know, uh, vests that actually fit properly that assume that you've got breasts underneath them. Like there's this little basic thing. And I remember sitting at a panel even in Victoria recently where they were talking about um, trying to upskill and get a lot of people involved um, in the construction industry. And they're talking about we need to reopen immigration because we can't get the skilled labour coming in. And I'm just like, really? Because there's like half the population sitting out there, probably more than half, that just don't feel welcome on your side. And you create these unhealthy environments for people where they don't want to work. And maybe if you fix those problems, you'd be able to fix the skill gap without immigration or without relying on immigration in that sense. Um, and it's funny because then you're right, two seconds later, toilet conversations pop up. Uh, and they're like, oh, we can't possibly create toilets for men and for women. And then there's all the LGBTQI plus, I don't know what they are, type toilets. I was like, you know what? I don't care. If men feel like they need to have their own toilet, that's fine. I'm quite happy to share mine with yeah, yeah. people who are trans, bisexual. Yeah. I'm not fussed, right? Like, yeah, it's yeah. just... <laughs> I'm still going to drive a kilometre. Whatever works, you know. <laughs> but yeah, let us yeah. come on site. We want to work for you. And... Um, and and just, you know, the buy into that uh, of really getting in there, um, I yeah. think it's just so interesting that it stems from the political, you know, state parliaments down when they talk about skill and diversity mixes of this whole, we need to immigrate men into skilled labour. Yeah, and I was really disappointed when I heard that too and that push by some industry groups around we need foreign labour because I think it's a short-term fix, which I see a lot in construction is the focus on the short term. And to your point, the Swiss cheese or death by a thousand paper cuts is kind yes. of, I think, what a lot of women feel. And interestingly as well, it's a type of, I think, um, it's not all men feel comfortable in construction too. you got to remember that too. That yep. I remember going and getting my Apple phone fixed at Apple um, doing my PhD and he asked me what I was doing it on and he said, oh, I would never consider a career in construction because I'm just not that type of guy. And I think, wow, we've really, we haven't just ruled, we're not only fishing from half a pond, we're fishing from probably, you know, 20, 30% of the pond actually when it comes to, you know, the richness of talent that we have on offer in our society. We're narrowing ourselves down. And, and the other thing I would say about that is that whilst we maintain that sort of, um, group of guys that are happy to work in the sector and perpetuate those sorts of and reward those sorts of um, behaviors you know around strength and toughness etc it actually isn't doing them any favors either because you know as we know the effects is that you know they might be drinking or smoking themselves away quietly behind the scenes and so that sort of straight jacket of masculinity has a real effect on on their health as well. So it's not a particularly healthy environment, um, keeping it to this type of, you know, employee, so to speak. Yeah, completely. And I think that, um, I suppose that the, my next line of questioning then goes into an, extenu uh, an extension of that work around five day working weeks. So, uh, for those that don't work in construction, because we get people who come and join the podcast for a number of different industries, you might be just absolutely gobsmacked to hear that um, it is 
standard practice in the construction industry that you would work a six day week at least. Um, sometimes your shifts might be for longer, shorter, like 10 days on, four days off, or wherever it might be to be, um, with the expectation in most places that if you can work 24-7 any day of the week, you're most likely to be more employable because that, that, that's the time they want to be constructing major projects so they finish quicker. Um, and so you can sit back and think like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if that hospital was built sooner? Um, and then the impact of that is that somebody had to have worked, you know, around the clock, multiple hours um, all day, really sort of stretching their limits um, and sort of impacting their uh, their own personal well-being in order to finish that project sooner, just so it can be completed. You know, what we're talking weeks usually um, of difference in construction time to when that asset who's going to that's going to sit there for a hundred years is finished. So it's in a relatively, if you're looking at the scale of the length of the lifespan of these types of construction, um, the extension um, in construction time by reducing it to a five-day week is quite negligible, really. Um, but it does have impacts on the way construction works. It does push the time out. It does add to costs. But it also has significant benefits um, in the well-being of everybody working on that project and can then open it up to other um, more diverse workforces and um, so I suppose now I'm going to hopefully haven't stolen too much of your thunder, but no, I was like, no. yeah, that's why. So let's, let's talk the stats from the research. What did we discover happened on projects that were five days a week? Yeah. So we studied, um, two projects, um, in New South Wales and the, and the very thankful to the funders of those projects, which was, um, Health Infrastructure New South Wales and Roberts Coa Construction Company. Um, and we studied predominantly um, two hospital sites, Concord and Liverpool um, hospitals, and then we compared it as well to a commercial site. And basically what we found is that about 75% of workers preferred a five-day over a six-day work week. And I will just reiterate that the sites were shut on the weekends, um, that workers couldn't work on that site. We also found that... Um, of those workers, 78% reported improvements in their work-life balance. They saw improvements in their job satisfaction, including interestingly work hours pay. And you've got to remember here too, we have a mix of wage and salaried workers, job security, family um, and work relationships. Um, we saw an increasing trend um, in the quality of life of workers and also in their mental health and a decreasing trend in injury rates. Um, when we interviewed the, the partners of the construction workers, they all noticed an improvement in their partner's mood and well-being. So they were less fatigued, more relaxed and more available. Um, many of them had actually, when we talked to, to the um, partners of construction workers, which is fascinating, sort of felt that they had to walk on eggshells on that one day off on a, on a Sunday. And I will just add that, you know, increasingly in our earlier research, we found that Sat whilst Saturday work is the norm, Sunday was increasingly the norm. And for, you know, building projects, for instance, those last couple of months where you ramp up, there's a lot more hours. People, you know, they basically throw humans onto those jobs. And similarly for civil works where you've got, you know, closure of a rail corridor, for instance, at occupation, then you have those intense periods there in the civil. Um, Interestingly, we found that there was no vari increase in variable cost to deliver this the projects, um, and there was a slight increase in the program time. But what was interesting is that um, on Concord Hospital, for instance, the five-day um, contract program was quicker than an alternative tender a six-day week program. So, you know, we're talking about small margins here. Um, we also found, and I think this is really interesting, and this is sort of where what I learned from the research is the importance of work hours. So on average, constructions on Concord Hospital worked 45.6 hours a week, um, and that was a reduction of about three hours per week from their previous work. Work hours are really important in terms of who gets to participate. And we know from research, um, like from Professor Lyndall Strasden at ANU and the OECD research that there is a real um, sweet spot in terms of work hours. So if you don't, if you have someone doing the care work for you and you can just go off to work and make sure that everything's done, your meal's done, your dog's walked, 
you know, your parents have been looked after, you can probably get away with, you know, around a 46 hour week. But once you have care or work or you're an older worker, that reduces significantly to 35 hours. So again, you know, inadvertently, the way we've designed work in construction really facilitates that it's men who are participating more than women. Um, yeah, and I guess for me, you know, it was really interesting looking at the effects of construction work on the partners of construction workers. And in many cases, these were heterosexual couples, so it was women. And what we found is that these women, you know, their own, they were worried about their economic security should they divorce their partner in the future because basically their, their own work had had to be curtailed. They had to reject promotions and extra work hours in their careers um, to allow for the for the very um, long hours of construction of their partner. And so they were concerned about their future economic security. And I think that feeds into a broader question around, you know, women's economic security. We know there's an issue there in our country with regards to that, that women end up with less superannuation, for instance. But this certainly was on front of mind for these, um, these partners of construction workers. So construction work doesn't just have an effect on the humans working in construction. It also has an effect on their partners partners and their families and the community by extension. Um, and if I might just say, one thing I did see a real shift in is, and, and I thought this was really interesting um, coming from, you know, my background, I was an Olympian, so, um, or I am an Olympian, I should say, this, you never pass one, but um, is that this real focus of men who really want to be active in their kids' lives and the importance of Saturday sport. So, you know, a lot of men, particularly are wage workers, were doing almost a cost benefit analysis in their mind around, you know, is that giving up a couple of hundred dollars a week, you know, the value of being able to participate and coach in my kids' sport, their rugby league or, you know, their AFL, for instance, or their netball or in actual fact, the first time I asked a group of um, workers this question, an older man said, oh, the younger guys won't be interested they are more interested in paying off their mortgage and paying it off quickly. And then when I work, walked down the end to a group of uh, younger guys, one of them said, oh, I love it. I get to see, I go take my girls to ballet on a Saturday and watch them do it. And I mean, honestly, you could have knocked me over <laughs> with the fact that you <laughs> yeah, right. to going to ballet. I was expecting, you know, rugby league, football, but no, it was ballet. And I, and yeah, so they, so I think the thing is to, um, we found that across the demographics, this was popular. It wasn't just older workers or younger workers. And we were worried that, you know, our sample of workers was quite biased, that some workers might have said, I want to go on Concord and work, and that and that would have skewed our results. But at the same time in New South Wales, um, the CFMEU were looking at, were doing enterprise bargaining agreements, and it was voted that, workers really wanted to have this option of a five-day work week in their EBA moving forward. So that was really positive. And, and um, so I think, you know, the doing of these experiments or these pilots of a five-day work week is just as important, you know, for workers to experience and to navigate it um, going forward. But I do think there's work that can be done uh, moving forward. I think we've really got to focus on decreasing work hours of workers to have that um, you know, to have a greater shift in relation to well-being and gender equality. Yeah, I think I think so as well. And I think similarly to you, when I read um, the results of that study, it was the effect on the spouses and the families that I think I was just most intrigued by because I don't think that I had even considered that option of, like you said, all the things that go along with that. And then the um, the children in those families start to see two parents having two different lives and then the, uh, that has an effect on what they consider their options and um and look at and, and opportunities really are for what they want to work in and see and it's just um you know I'm 
at, you know, like I said, we're both kids of construction, right? Like I want to see more women be able to get out there in construction. It's a great gig if you can get it. And, um, you know, hopefully we can turn it into an industry where people want to be able to work in there um, because there is a sense of pride and I can still see the glimmer in my dad's eyes when he used to drive us past and show the big things that he used to build. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. you know, oh, I remember my dad used to build that and he's like quite proud to be able to do that. And there's not many industries that you can sort of, you know, after the fact, take them up right in and amongst it and go like, you know, I remember when we were building that pile on this happened and tell all those fun stories um, and really sort of get involved in what your parents are doing and hopefully uh, we can start doing that more um, with kids with their both of their parents and not just one of them in the construction industry um, and you know what and let's let's try and get five-day work weeks not just on hospitals I know it kind of it makes sense on a hospital that you try not to kill people building it that more than what you save once it's built you know essentially that's what we're talking here like you know, how many suicides went into the construction of a hospital, that can't be a really good measure. So sort of piloting these on hospitals makes perfect sense. And, you know, I'd also like to make sure that the, the trains that I catch, that no people committed suicide during those as well. So I love that the research that you're doing, I think it's absolutely, um, and like I said at the start, I think the relevance and the application of this today in the real world is so visceral um, that most people can get hold of this. So please keep doing what you're doing. I read there, your papers. <laughs> there is more research coming on, there's a whole ro run of pilots coming now at the moment being Yay. studied on a five day. So keep an eye out. Definitely. Well, like I said, I'm, I'll definitely keep an eye out. I might, you know, most people probably won't be as enthusiastic as me, but I'll definitely <laughs> enthusiastically spread the word around all of the outcomes of it and see if we can create some industry change. Um, so on that note, um, Natalie, thank you so much for joining me today. <laughs> a pleasure, a pleasure. And I'm just so thrilled someone reads the report. <laughs> I know I you do you. because I can I hear what you're saying. I'm like, yeah. oh. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm like one of those like TV show hosts that just pretends to read the book and then introduces John to talk about it. And I was like, no, like I'm properly fangirling you. Anyway, um, <laughs> and thanks everybody for listening to the People Planet Profit podcast. Until our next episode, goodbye.